Welcome to this video dealing with the seismic retrofitting of cultural heritage objects. After a brief introduction, we cover retrofitting techniques considering the improvement of connections, then the improvement of overall building performances presented, and finally seismic isolation techniques. Earthquakes are characterized as stochastic or random non-ergodic processes. This means that it can be very hard to predict their impact. This infers the fact that damage to cultural heritage objects is also not easy to predict and even less so to counteract. Additionally, historical structures are usually built with some level of uncertainty and therefore various defects can arise that make the effects of interventions useless and even increase the vulnerability of the cultural heritage assets. Naturally, there are many cases in which the use of inappropriate interventions worsened the preparedness of a building to withstand dynamic actions. There have been numerous examples where physically and often chemically incompatible materials were used. In some cases, even though the intention is to increase the resistance of an object, incompatible structural elements and analysis actually lead to adverse effects. The need to improve the ability of an existing building to withstand seismic forces usually arises from evidence of damage or poor behavior during recent earthquakes. It can also arise from calculations or as a result of comparisons with similar buildings that have been damaged in other places. Let us briefly name the focus areas associated with intervention, in other words, repairs, restorations, and seismic strengthening of buildings. Materials and techniques for intervention, techniques for structural connections, testing and substructuring test methods, optimization approach for cultural heritage buildings, monitoring and early warning systems, integrated multidisciplinary approach for cultural heritage, and standardization. Joints are practically the most important parts in which the stiffness of a structure is inherently present. Basically, this is because the resultant internal forces create work on the deformation, thus the moments create work on rotations, while the shear forces create the cracks, etc. Therefore, the primary focus should be on improvement of the resistance of joints and connections. If possible, the joints are the ideal place to install dissipative gadgets, so that they can effectively dissipate the energy coming from the earthquake. Here is an example of a new resistant retrofitted joint that was built upon an old carpentry joint. The dissipative capacity of the dovetail joint was increased significantly by the appropriate placement of heavy-duty nails. Similarly, strengthening of connections can be provided by employing anchoring ties or reinforcing rings as shown in this slide. Local rebuilding can also help to increase the resistance of the joints. Specific building elements such as vaults, for example, can be reinforced by using anchoring ties and external metallic elements. This is a more traditional strengthening technique which has been used for a long time, particularly on churches. The application of fiber-reinforced polymers to extrados, a more modern approach, is usually preferred where possible in order to minimize the visual impact of the intervention. Floors can be retrofitted by in-plane and bending stiffening using the dry technique or by external stiffening with wood blocks, strips or FRP. Internal interventions can be carried out using bracing with metallic ties. It is important that floors are properly anchored to walls to avoid the slipping of the beams and to develop a distribution action of the horizontal and retaining forces of the walls. Similarly, roof structures can be retrofitted using metallic or fiber reinforcement. In this slide, we can see an example of strengthening using metal ties. Finally, walls can be retrofitted by employing various techniques. Local rebuilding, mixture injections, joint repointing, reinforced repointing, single wall insert, ties insert, reinforced plaster, FRP plating, and post-tensioned vertical ties. Injection is an important intervention that can be used to strengthen walls when feasible. It involves four steps. Firstly, knowledge of the transversal section of the masonry is required in order to evaluate its capability of being injected into. Secondly, an appropriate injection mixture should be selected, paying attention to chemical-physical mechanical compatibility. Thirdly, the number of injection holes, their disposition, the pressure and the injection time should be determined. 
And finally, the results of the intervention should be assessed through suitable control techniques. Seismically isolated buildings have a flexible isolation layer which limits the transfer of forces from the ground to the superstructure. Base isolation, also known as seismic isolation, is a state-of-the-art method that constitutes one of the most effective means of protecting a structure against earthquake forces. A collection of structural components called isolators are used to decouple to a large extent the superstructure from the base, the foundation or substructure, that rests on shaking ground, thus protecting the integrity of the building. Energy absorption in the seismically isolated level can further reduce these forces. Isolation bearings provide stability during gravitational loads while allowing for lateral motion during earthquakes by having a low lateral stiffness. Additional energy is dissipated through yielding or viscous damping devices which can help control the lateral displacement of the isolator. It is important that the behavior of the isolator is stable and repeatable under multiple earthquake motions. It is necessary for structural engineers to select the correct earthquake ground motions and target performance. Ground motion selection should be based on potential earthquakes of varying frequency that may occur at the location of the building. Target performance should be based on a client's needs as well as engineering judgment. The main principle of seismic isolation is to allow the building to move as a rigid body, while no deformation in the building itself occurs due to the inertial forces of the relative motion. The building moves as a rigid body together with the ground. In conclusion, we may say that the efficacy of a retrofit is usually evaluated by observing damage from past events. Building components should be retrofitted, keeping in mind an appropriate balance between structural and heritage requirements. Efficient isolation and dissipation is that which relieves a structure from seismic action. However, with regard to cultural heritage objects, this is a demanding task. Thank you for your attention.